afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to this uh, um, KCash Global Forum. Uh, we are organizing today a lecture from the Retina site, and we have the pleasure to have as a guest speaker Professor Mario Romano. Professor Mario Romano is a social professor of ophthalmology at the Humanitas University uh, in Milan, uh, Italy, and is the chairman of the ophthalmology department at the Humanitas Gavezzani Hospital in Bergamo. Uh, he, uh, as you uh, might have heard in the news, um, he is practicing in Bergamo, which is one of the cities which has uh, mostly been hit by the um, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, up to yesterday, I was looking at the number. There are more than 10,000 people uh, positive to the corona in Bergamo province only, and more than 2,000 deaths. Uh, so Mario had uh, um, uh, the unfortunate uh, or fortunate uh, um, uh, possibility of working with uh, um, many of these patients and to build up a, a, in such a short time a good experience and how to handle them and uh, uh, not only in the clinical, not only recognizing clinical pictures, but also in the way uh, that ophthalmology should handle now this uh, type of patients. Um, uh, I would like to thank Mario for finding the time of uh, being here with us. And uh, because he's very busy at the moment, uh, also with the his, his number is just the number of healthy people contaminated by each virus infected person. So it's just a measure of disease potential. Why the red zone? Because avoid numbers of serious acute respiratory syndrome, giving us more time for effective patient care and reorganization. So. Um, just a uh, just few words about the virus and infection. We know that the virus uh, has uh, uh, four proteins. One is the spike protein, that is the corona of the virus, and act as an anchor allowing virus attachment to the ACE2 enzyme and allows also the entry inside the host cells. We need also to remember that coronavirus are zoonotic. That means they are transmitted you know, from the animals to humans and the intermediate host is the pangolin. That is an important ingredient in Chinese medicine and cuisine. Then you know, the virus go on the epithelial cells, but you know, the mucus that is secreted by globet cell is the first effective barrier and works well. The point is when the virus has entered on the target cells, you know, the viral RNA is immediate, immediately translated and uh, you know, by the host cells that die then release millions of new virus. So um, the, the problem that with the COVID-19, the immunity doesn't work well. So the innate immunity that's block over 90% of pathogens doesn't work well in COVID-19. We have a decrease of lymphocytes, increase of neutrophils, and a decrease in interferon. And also the adaptive immunity seems to work differently, basically through the TL per one, but we have a decrease of antigen presenting cells, plus one and two HLA, and also decrease of interferon F. Then another important, uh, you know, statement that probably, you know, the, we have uh, this immune response and resistance should work at least, uh, last at least for six, 12 months. So, I mean, we need also to think about that because when we will going to start again, you know, our, you know, activity. Regarding diagnostic tests, this is important for us. Nasal uh, swab is the one that works much better, of course, than the conjunctival swab. And we are using the PCR. We have not still clear data on the percent of false negative. The PCR takes four hours at least, you know, but uh, um, also there are, there are other diagnostic tests that are coming with antibodies are commercial available, but we have not still validated the you know, comparison between the antibodies and the PCR assay. Important also to remember about the assessment of immunological memory, because now are available also tests on 
IgM and IgG. The IgM, we know that indicates a recent infection. IgG appears from, you know, 15, 20 days from the primary exposure, as you can see here in the picture. So it's important because the antibody will be important for diagnosis, also epidemiology and the provision for returning to work. And also the convalescence could be the ideal plasma donors. This is another line of treatment. Recently, we published this paper, Facing COVID-19 in Ophthalmology Department. And uh, we need to keep in mind that ophthalmologists are at high risk and is also at high risk our outpatient clinic because of respiratory droplets at the slit lamp and because the high risk population that no, we, are, uh, we are treating. So we need uh, rethinking the way we visit and treat the patient. groups that uh, something related only or you know old people but is recently published on lancet infected diseases you know also between 40 years old and 60 years old is a, a big percent of the patient that can be you know hospitalized so that means that the situation goes is you know, not so you know easy so first of all we need to think about the because we need a patient stratification system because we need to know which one has to be seen face to face which one we can rebook in three months head and which one between four six months head so in this paper also according to the other guy And uh, so what we found that uh, is important, first of all, the general triage that can be done by the secretary of outpatient clinic. The question are, you know, if uh, they have been in close contact with the person no or suspected to have coronavirus, if they have a cough, a shortness of breath, of course, and if they have, uh, you know, fever, so the temperature more than 37.5. The triage is done by phone call, but also sometimes with you know, Skype, Zoom, or uh, Teams, so other voice. And uh, uh, this is for general triage. And then uh, we, are, we have also the ophthalmology triage. So are done by trained nurses or optoptists with the ophthalmology support in case they want to have more information. You cannot see well, of course, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, this picture, but you can find the picture on the paper that we have published. I think that can be, you know, useful because are divided uh, in low risk, medium risk, and high risk. So high risk uh, are the patient that we have to see face to face, green for the one that you can see in three months, and medium the one that we can see in between, um, uh, sorry, green in four, six months, and the yellow, the one that we can see in three months. According to the different pathologies, coronary glaucoma, cataract, medical retina, VR, and, uh, you know, so on. And so it's important also, you know, for the, you know, have a, an idea for the triage, how to manage it. So if, uh, you know, we have to see the patient face to face, it means it's in high risk. So we have the first of all, the entrance hospital checkpoint. So it's, a, it's still another triage, the tri hospital triage. And so if they have the temperature more than 37.5 with moderate symptom, they go back home and they have been visited remotely. If they have severe symptoms, uh, we need to inform the primary care. So, and the staff, they will go to get the, you know, the, the patient and you know, to have a different, you know, um, way uh, pathway. If the patient has uh, you know less than 37.5 you know uh, temperature you know after hands disinfection gloves and surgical face mask on they go in the waiting area, seated in you know, a distance be in over two meter, and then we try to reduce the waiting time because we schedule the patient every 30 45 minutes, and then of course every you know the uh, single visit, we have a sanitation of uh, the potential contaminated environment. So what uh, the 
what about the, the thing about the staff organization? The aim is to free up much needed resources. So this, uh, what we are doing, uh, we, rec we are splitting the staff in two segregated teams to minimize the contamination. One that is working with COVID positive patient and the second that is working with COVID negative patient. So they don't have to meet, so the two staff, they don't, don't have to meet each other. So uh, they have different entrants, different, I mean, they, they like being in two different hospitals. And we need also to keep in mind uh, regarding the colleagues that are in the private uh, are in contact with increased risk uh, people should be allocated in a low risk area. So working remotely or, you know, um, provided uh, an alternative accommodation, not going back home. So regarding uh, the protection in the clinic, you know better than me that we need the PPE, that means gloves, that means waterproof gowns, uh, aprons, uh, and mask FFP2, FFP3. What is important, I think, for the ophthalmologist using, uh, you know, goggles, because uh, with the face shield, we cannot really use the uh, indirect ophthalmoscope, so it's better to use this mask. And also, if you need to do to go in uh, intensive care unit uh, to see the fundus of the patient, it's better to use this one because most of the time they are giving you this face sheet that you cannot really use. Uh, you know the indirect ophthalmoscope. Also important, the slit lamp. You know, bread shield uh, now is available. I think you know everywhere. Uh, we need to protect the consultation room. So. Uh, one important point that is just recently published, how long is the coronavirus detectable on the surfaces? And you see, you know, it's different, the time that uh, can be detected according, you know, to the material. And on the plastic, one of the, you know, material that uh, is uh, everywhere stays uh, the coronavirus there for three days. So it's important to use these antimicrobial, uh, antimicrobial uh, agents for surface sanitation. And uh, you know the most used are the first two one ethanol and sodium hypochlorite. In OR, it's important also to use the skirt that can reduce the aerosol spread. But we need to keep in mind that as we move, you know the you know this protection, we can reatomize the virus into the air. Now we are you know uh, working on this project. Uh, um, granted uh, that uh, the, we are uh, we are making this uh, under pressure um, uh, space. So in inside the theater, we want uh, a negative pressure. So uh, and this project seems that is working well. And also we have uh, uh, you know a, um, another group in Italy that already have uh, the good results. So basically we in um, uh, we have a low air inflow the theater but the high air outflow so this negative pressure does not allow the 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 virus the aerosol to get out but this is immediately you know um, uh, eliminated with the high air outflow channels so um, what about the treatment so if we need to see and treat the patient we try to use the indirect ophthalmoscopy rather than slit lamp to see the, to the retina. If we need to do the laser, we try to do with the indirect ophthalmoscope instead of slit lamp laser. And uh, we are also using uh, these uh, drops. Uh, we have not much evidence, but in the literature, there's not evidence for the conjunctiva, but in uh, other fields that uh, the ozonated drops uh, and uh, the povidone iodine 0.7% drops can help help because uh, their antimicrobial and septic activity may be useful in preventing infection through the eye tissue and secretion so it's important also to protect the staff itself uh, so uh, is uh, uh, not just for the conjunctivitis, but uh, in order to avoid, you know, the spreading on our conch of uh, from the aerosol coming from the patient. Regarding the clinical findings, uh, uh, we have uh, the, this is a comparison uh, between 
uh, cold, uh, high fever, and uh, COVID-19. As you can see here, there's not you know, really a big difference. The conjunctivitis that is present in between five, five and seven percent of patients is, uh, I mean, nothing really. And uh, it's also present, you know, in a common cold and uh, so in uh, other in uh, allergy. So the point is, uh, is not a big problem for sure. Uh, but it uh, seems that the transmission uh, can be, you know, uh, really, you know, effective to the, you know, to the third. is not the conjunctivitis, but that can be, you know, uh, 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 transmitted by the, you know, uh, tears. And uh, we need to keep also in mind that 70% have mild symptoms, uh, but, uh, you know, 12% of all the positive cases are going to ICU unit. And uh, in Italy overall, we have an 85, 8.5% uh, of, uh, you know, uh, fatality rate that uh, is uh, really uh, a lot, we think. So this is what you can see in the conjunctivitis, addition between tarsal and bulbar conch, follicles, hemorrhage, and uh, inflammatory membranes. And it's been published recently, there is no correlation between conjunctival and nasal pharyngeal swab. So that means it's better to go for nasal pharyngeal swab, not for conjunctival swab. What we can see on the conch, is follicles, not papilla. Follicles that consist of hyperplastic lymphoid tissue that appears as elevated lesion with the tubes around, okay? Whereas a papilla that is not present in the COVID uh, consists in hyperplastic conjunctival tissue, okay? Different location also of the vessels. So we will see you know, more follicles, of course, in COVID one. And this is our protocol. Basically, the inpatient have oxygen therapy. We have enoxaparin subcutaneously. And then we go for a combination of antiviral therapy and hydroxychloroquine. Antiviral therapy, the commercial name is Caletra, and is lopinavir plus ritonavir. Whereas uh, we, then we are also using at the same time hydroxychloroquine. And uh, when the patient, uh, you know, can stay home, we are going, we, we are giving, uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine, so placanil, the first day 400 milligrams two times a day, and then for nine days, 200 milligrams twice a day. Okay, so as you can see here, we are using also placanil, in other countries, they are not using placanil. There are, you know, few um, studies going on, and uh, so we are. Uh, nobody is, uh, you know, uh, sure that the placanil can make difference, or just, uh, you know, the best therapy right now is just the, you know, caletra, so lopinavir plus ritonavir. This uh, is also important, I think, uh, that uh, in intensive care unit, uh, the patient, uh, you know, um, are kept in prone positioning. So with prone position is a high risk of corneal injury. Uh, as you know, you know, it's, it's very easy to treat, just a steroid strip on with, you know, antiseptic or lubrificant drop. But, uh, you know, they can also have central retinal artery occlusion or ischemic optic neuropathy because of the severe systemic hypotension of hypoxemia due to the, uh, of course, the respiratory distress syndrome and also due to prolonged prone position. So if, uh, you know, they call you uh, saying, um, sorry, but the patient, you know, cannot see uh, anymore, keep in mind that you need to see the fundus because probably you can have, you know, an occlusion. So currently, you know, we are using, uh, most of the time, uh, Caletra plus uh, hydroxychloroquine. So this is uh, the reason why we also rethinking about, uh, you know, the drug toxicity and we are organizing a dedicated screening program because, you know, some drug users, you know, have recognized a macrotoxicity, both of them, hydroxychloroquine and ritonavir. 
So regarding uh, um, regarding uh, the um, hydroxychloroquine, you know, works with the inhibition of endocytosis, so reduce the endosome acidity, so reduce the endocytosis itself, and uh, the um, uh, ritonavir and lopinavir they reduce the proteases. So. Um, Basically, the drug mechanism of uh, lopinavir and ritonavir uh, is to inhibit the proteases during the assembly of a new virus. So a, a more direct you know, effect and efficacy, whereas the hydroxychloroquine decreases the acidity in the endosome, but we know it is not the endosome, the main entryway for the virus but the, the main, main entrance is a different one, as uh, I was uh, telling you before. So uh, probably hydroxychloroquine works not just as antiviral, but works also in modulating the inflammation. That is one of the problems related you know, to the COVID infection. So regarding the ritonavir, um, we know that has been described uh, RP hypertrophy, Bull's eye maculopathy, RP epiteliopathy, pseudo retinitis pigmentosa, so many changes uh, um, on the RP. And as you can see, there are a few patterns that you can also you can see by, uh, well with you know uh, autofluorescence that sure mark the hyper hyperfluorescence of RP changes. And also, and cross-sectional OCT, you can see hyperreflectivity of ellipsoid zone, okay? And also annular para, paraphobia okay? with reduced foveal sensitivity. It's been, uh, they've been described, you know, in many um, case reports, uh, this, uh, you know, drug toxicity related to the ritonavir and uh, you know better than me also the um, toxicity related to the hydroxychloroquine, bullseye maculopathy, loss of a foveal reflex, uh, seems to have this, the same target, both ritonavir and hydroxychloroquine. It's been also published uh, uh, that uh, hydroxychloroquine plus tamoxifen have, uh, you know, a really, um, uh, adverse synergism, you know, being, uh, you know, together. And the odds ratio is five. So it means they have five more times, you know, the chance to develop, you know, the, this uh, iatrogenic damage on RP. So the point that we also send a letter to American journals and, you know, we alert for a possible synergic toxicity of, for the retina using both together as the, the, just like what happens with the tamoxifen. We don't know right now, but you know, we have now, we are setting up you know, this screening, it's, it's important because you know, uh, we need to recognize and then uh, some patients, they can also have uh, other uh, um, high risk uh, factors like uh, they uh, have uh, you know, maculopathy, uh, age related maculopathy or other disease that can you know, uh, increase this risk. So according uh, to the paper published uh, from the American Journal, if uh, you know, the patient uh, has, uh, has been treated with hydroxychloroquine is to do at least a fundus examination and OCT. Of course, uh, this, uh, we, um, um, for ritonavir and hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine are speaking about the chronic toxicity, not acute toxicity. There are just few reports about acute toxicity still you know uh, we can have probably in findings related to the fact that we are using both together at the same time other you know two drugs that are also uh, um, have you know some space in the treatment um, and especially the, the tocilizumab that is a, is a monoclonal antibody is also there are just limited evidence right now there are you know few trials going on and they can also have a drug toxicity like cotton wool spots and also uitis or papilledema just few reports in the literature but you know if we are using still in combination we need to 
better see if you know they can have something related with the retinal damage. So um, we, this is uh, the uh, ocular screening program that we said. So at baseline, so when we discharge the patient, of course we are doing just for the patient that we can discharge. When the patient is in the hospital and or intensive care unit, we really, you know, and we and all the other, you know, staff don't care really about the toxicity of the retina. They are just asking you to see if the prone position is getting any damage or if they have like uh, some, uh, you know, epithelial uh, damage, but nothing, you know, really related with the drug toxicity but for the for the discharge patient we ask you know to uh, see you know the the retina and doing a fundus autofluorescence and uh, also octa because you can have also some you know uh, damage to the vessels ocular vessels and then we ask to back again in six and in 12 months and um, this is uh, the situation in Italy right now. So uh, uh, today, this is the, the, the data from today. Uh, we have about uh, um, 143,000 people affected and, uh, you know, 18,000 uh, uh, people, you know, uh, died for, you know, coronavirus. And uh, the, the situation, the, the curve you see is still growing. The, this is the total positive patient. But, you know, uh, is, uh, the situation of uh, daily new cases right now are decreasing. So this is important for us because it means that, you know, we expect this curve is going down a bit, you know, in the next uh, um, few weeks. We expect to be in you know, a lockdown for at least uh, uh, six, uh, seven uh, more weeks. Okay, and uh, we don't know the, the another point probably to you know speak about and how to start again. You know how to you know manage you know the the uh, the ophthalmology you know and the service after you know the. Uh, the opens of uh, the uh, the red zone because uh, we cannot start with the same volume of patient because we may increase again the risk of dissemination and so that's it uh, this is uh, you know our experience uh, and um, so if you have any question uh, no, please uh, you know if uh, I can answer you know I'm more than happy thank you professor. thank you very much and thank you Mario very nice overview, uh, not only about the active active cases of uh, COVID, but also especially the complication that can be coming from the drug treatments and um, in some points also for how to restart and how to protect ourselves in this uh, difficult moment. Now, Dr. Achille, I think has some questions that he will put to you and uh, I'll give him the word. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I really appreciate you giving us this time. Uh, I do have a question just to, to start the discussion. Uh, you know, as uh, ophthalmologists, we, we are worried that, uh, that we've been hearing a lot about uh, people be, being called upon to, uh, to be uh, involved in the treatment in the ICU outside your, your comfort zone or your specialty. Is this something that's happening there in, in, your, uh, in your area? So they are asking us you know, to help them in somehow, okay? So this is just for the volunteers, the one that wanna really, you know, uh, you know, help in, uh, you know, in the, this situation, this bad situation. I was one of the volunteer, okay? And um, so what do I, we are doing, uh, uh, basically we are doing administrative work. That means we are, uh, we need to keep the contact between uh, the, patient that are inside okay the inpatient and the families this is uh, i mean uh, it's not easy because uh, i mean we need to call them and uh, we need to see you know how is the situation and we need to tell uh, if it's improving if it's getting worse if it's moving from you know um, intensive from uh, you know ward to the intensive care unit and uh, because sometimes they have no contact anymore at all and uh, if something goes wrong they cannot see the patient even 
you know, when the situation is really bad. And uh, so sometimes they want to really have uh, a kind of, uh, you know, contact uh, with uh, a phone call or with the... Uh, so really, uh, the situation is not easy. And so what we are doing is trying you know, to keep this. And then uh, sometimes they're asking for monitoring or doing... Uh, we, we don't do really something uh, that is, uh, you know, dangerous uh, for anybody for us or for the patient, because they are asking easy stuff, not really. Oh. You know. I see. Uh, we, oh, this is a great job. We appreciate this uh, from you. You know, this is, uh, we've been trained as ophthalmologists, but uh, people are always, always afraid of doing something outside of their comfort zone. So we appreciate that. I have a couple of questions from, uh, from the attendees here. Uh, some of them are asking about the kits uh, needed in, in the examination uh, when you're consulted, whether it's you're consulted within the, the clinic or when you go to the patient and examine if they need you to see a patient in the, in the intensive care unit. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we are going, uh, I mean, if the patient is in the intensive care unit, uh, I mean, they cannot move from there. They cannot move even, even for if they are, you know, in the world and, uh, they can, I mean, the COVID patient has to stay in his room. So we need to go there and we need to see the patient. So most of the time we are just using indirect ophthalmoscope. We are not using anything yes. else. Even because uh, if, uh, you know, uh, you want to see the conjunctivitis, really, you know, this is not uh, a big issue uh, uh, because it's something uh, just related to the con. In case you want to see if the uh, epithelium is okay still uh, you can uh, use you know the light uh, and uh, you know you can dye the epithelium but it's not really um, uh, necessary to bring them to the slit lamp i see uh, i have another question from uh, from uh, uh, dr adel haydan he's asking about the hydroxychloroquine do you think this uh, damage can happen in such a short period of, uh, of, of treatment i don't think so I don't think it's a matter. So the dose that we are using uh, is uh, double uh, for a few days. Yes. And uh, uh, but I think the hydroxychloroquine kind alone cannot be so dangerous. Cannot induce drug toxicity. Uh, the point is uh, that uh, the combination of both probably can. And uh, really, um, you know, nobody knows because nobody has this experience. Uh, still, you know, we, uh, when we discharge the visit looking to the fullness of the fluorescence, uh, you know, without the uh, fluorescent angiography, you know, I think uh, can be, you know, if they have any other uh, risk related to maculopathy, you know, it's better, you know, to know and uh, to tell the patient. Okay. This day takes us to the other question. Do you, uh, do you think it's safe to examine patients who are going for discharge or, uh, or do, you, do you rather uh, have them come later? Okay, so um, of course uh, you need that at the baseline because then you see the patient in six months, okay. At baseline, you can see the patient by time are negative when you discharge the patient, okay? So they go for uh, the, 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 the first swab and then the second one. If the second one is okay, we do the visit. So baseline for us is not just the day of uh, when we discharge the patient, but can be just a few days later. You understand what yeah. I mean? So, uh, so, uh, because if the maculopathy is present in two weeks, we need to, we can tell them, you know, that we need to see again in six months. If the maculopathy in two, three weeks is not present anymore, it's not a problem for me, it's not a problem for the patient, so. <laughs> I, I think um, I would want everyone to know that you can raise your hand if you have any questions and we can open the mic for you to ask. I think Dr. Asosa Nuelati uh, has a question, please. Uh, um, hi, 
Hello, uh, Professor Romano. Thank you very much for uh, uh, giving us this wonderful lecture. I actually have a few questions, so I'm going to just uh, uh, give you a few points and then feel free to, to answer those uh, that you would like. Uh, I was very uh, interested in your way of segregating a staff uh, to those who treat COVID positive and those who treat COVID negative. And I'm wondering if you also have set up the hospital where you work with special areas, especially for COVID positive and especially for COVID negative, or are you applying the uh, decontamination um, exactly the same everywhere? That is question number one. Um, my question number two is about the iodine drop for the, as a prophylactic for the uh, uh, patient for, to protect the staff. If you can give us a little bit more information about when to apply it, how many drops and what concentration. Um, the third, um, may I? Uh, and then, may I? Yes. Um, the third question is about um, your choice of using uh, the um, uh, re ritonavir plus the hydroxychloroquine, uh, since both have ocular toxicity, uh, why, is, why are you not uh, using the azithromycin uh, that has been proposed in France in, a, in addition to the uh, hydroxychloroquine, which does not have ocular toxicity and may have some cardiac toxicity? And the last question is that uh, you mentioned something that I didn't even think about, which is like uh, the possibility of an ischemic optic neuropathy and the central retinal artery occlusion in a patient who has hypoxia. And we know that these people have hypoxemia. Uh, what do you do in a case like this? What, what, what measures do you do? Okay. So uh, I forgot the first question. The first question. <laughs> do you segregate? I'm sorry. Do you do you segregate the hospital? Yeah. Do you segregate the, the treatment yeah. area? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, as you know, in uh, you know between, uh, so keep in mind that we have uh, a lot of positive in our department. A lot of uh, colleagues were positive, and one of our colleague, you know, died for COVID. Okay. So I was an ophthalmologist. So um, the point is uh, we want to keep uh, the segregation you know, between the colleagues uh, because uh, first of all, uh, is, uh, is for the colleagues itself. Yes. Because there are some colleagues that are at high risk because of the age, because of comorbidities, and because they have back home you know, somebody else that is high risk. So that's why you know, we, you know, the, the, the advice to segregate in two different tips. Mm -hmm. The segregation means that, uh, you know, you really don't know if the patient that you are seeing is, uh, can be positive or not positive, okay? But you know sometimes for sure that, uh, you know, few patient positive that need sure. to be seen, okay? Okay, so that means that even uh, the, stuff that is working with the COVID, the negative, is uh, still, uh, you know, wearing everything, like, like mask, everything. But uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, there are, you know, few differences, like using mask FFP3, okay, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you are using uh, for COVID uh, positive, for sure. And um, so there are just, uh, we try to minimize the risk, okay? We, we still, uh, even for COVID negative, using, uh, you know, the, all the protection uh, that we I need. See. But no, the sanification we are doing, uh, um, of course, uh, you know, um, for uh, between uh, each patient COVID positive, and we are still doing uh, you know, for COVID negative, uh, but the, pro the problem is that we want to minimize the risk of, uh, you know, outbreak between the, the colleagues and between colleagues and patients, okay? All right. So, this is one. The second is uh, Yopidine, okay. So, um, the Betadine, the Iopidine. Yopidine. I'm sorry, the, the yeah. iodine. The iodine, yeah. The iodine, the, the better dine drops. Iodine, the, yeah, yeah. Yes. In Italy, we have a drop, okay, uh, that has 0.7% concentration, okay, and, and uh, there are a few papers published that say that, you know, is uh, um, as this antimicrobial antiviral efficacy. And so what do we have, uh, no, we are setting up now a study 
with uh, a conjunctival swap on COVID that uh, we already know that are positive, then uh, using uh, this drop three times a day, okay, and then doing it again, the swap, to see just if, uh, you know, becomes uh, just the conjunctival swap negative. Uh, we have evidence not for the for the eye conch, but uh, you know because uh, this uh, is available for the tech the, the, the ourselves to, to protect you know the ophthalmologist because sometimes on the slit lamp or, or in other examination you are very close and so we are using not for treatment of a conjunctiva, conjunctivitis but for for prevention. Okay. Regarding uh, the uh, ritonavir, uh, so um, we, of course, so we are we, we are not in charge to you know, uh, to choose between uh, ritonavir because we are ophthalmologists. But uh, I have been speaking uh, with uh, you know some colleagues uh, in other country in uh, um, China and in other countries that had this problem before us. And what we found is that at the end, most of them are using antiviral, you know. Um, that's why Italy also, you know, start to use antiviral and uh, hydroxychloroquine. We have no experience with the azithromycin, but we are using just azithromycin in, a, in combination with the ritonavir and hydroxychloroquine, not just azithromycin, you know, by itself. Because what we think is still a, you know, viral infection, and uh, the main entrance of the viral infection is between of the binding between the spike protein and uh, and uh, the uh, ACE2 enzyme and uh, you know azithromycin and uh, hydroxychloroquine have no direct effect on this uh, you know um, uh, point so that's why I you know this is what uh, you know I believe and what the colleagues are telling but of course it's not a matter of the ophthalmology and uh, what the other point is uh, hydroxychloroquine well, so now they are using also, you know, monoclonal antibody because it seems it's also important to modulate the inflammatory reaction. Yes. This is uh, the main point. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, nobody knows really what is the best treatment, but uh, this is uh, the state of art at the moment, I think. Thank you for, for this, uh, for this answers. Uh, we do have other questions from, uh, from, uh, uh, from our colleagues who are in uh, uveitis. Dr. Hassan Adibi is asking uh, about your, uh, uh, have you found any difference in the incidence of infection between uveitis patients on immune or immunocompromised uh, that are using immunosuppressive or biologics in, in your population so far? Uh, we have uh, no clear evidence about that because you need to have like, uh, you know, a, um, uh, you know, like uh, a study on the population, quite, I, I cannot really answer, because, uh, you know, one interesting thing is uh, if the patient is already under treatment with, uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine, uh, probably have, uh, you know, less, uh, you know, uh, um, severe symptoms uh, that uh, other patients, but really we have uh, not the hands of right now. I mean, uh, not really. Uh, Dr. Saad Wahib is asking here about, uh, have you been asked to operate on, on COVID-19 uh, uh, patients? Uh, I mean, in, in, yeah, in Europe, you know, we are doing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, activity and the surgery and also in the COVID because, you know, sometimes you need to do it. And uh, think about there are also, you know, asymptomatic patients. There are also, you know, patients that develop retinal detachment and have been, uh, you know, positive for COVID, you know, until a few days before. So that's why now we are using uh, this, uh, you know, uh, cover. And, uh, but the real point is not that because when you move them uh, a lot and you, you know, move the, the cover that you're using yes. on the patient, a lot of, uh, you know, I was the brain Spreading around, yeah. So that's why now, uh, you know, with this uh, um, negative pressure inside, because normally inside the, the room, the operating room, there's a positive pressure. 
and everything when you open the door everything goes uh, you know away goes out goes you know like uh, you know outside of the theater and uh, so this the spreading is very bad and uh, they have positive normally positive pressure because they want to you know um, uh, flow uh, everything you know out with that negative pressure you keep uh, all the the theater theater closed with the you know the door closed and uh, everything goes out uh, out you know to the um to, from the you know filter so nothing stays inside and nothing you know goes outside of the theater so that's uh, that's why you know we are uh, um we are using uh, this uh, this uh, i mean we got a grant for you know work on this but uh, in another hospital in italy where they are doing uh, since you know um a few months now seems that is working well i would want to mention that i i'm seeing a lot of people thanking you for the efforts uh, that you're doing i just want to transfer this to you because it's here on the chat and then the questions i uh, thank you very much um so, so uh, Dr. Amshar Al-Tamimi here is asking if you think that all patients presenting with conjunctivitis should be managed with extreme caution in the situation you guys have in, in, in Pergamo now. Thank you. That's, uh, that's for sure, okay, because uh, especially now where we stay, where we live, I mean, where, where I'm working, you know, when, you know, think about conjunctivitis, we immediately think about, you know, COVID. But you know, uh, still, uh, conjunctivitis is present uh, in uh, five, uh, you know, to seven percent of the cases. And uh, but uh, if you already have conjunctivitis, uh, you are this, uh, the probability to have COVID is higher, of course. So every time we say conjunctivitis, you know, we have uh, you know complete uh, you know um, cover protection. and protection. Of course, you know you need to uh, understand you need to also to ask the patient if there's some other things like anosmia and uh, you know the uh, other symptoms that you know now better than me but uh, still when you see conjunctivitis you know keep uh, an eye on it please. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, a question uh, i don't know if this is outside of ophthalmology dr mahmoud shwail is asking uh, do you know why they're putting them in, in prone position because we know that it makes things much worse in terms even uh, yeah, I, they, I mean, uh, uh, the answer on uh, in the intensive care units is that just that the patient can, uh, you know, expand better and can, uh, I know, I know, the, the, the volume of the air inside is higher. I don't know really, but uh, I don't have, you know, a exact explanation, but, uh, you know, most of them are in prone position. Uh, a question about uh, about the role of anticoagulants uh, in in the treatment. Uh, can you expand more? If you, if you yeah, have... because the patient with uh, this infection has a higher risk rate uh, of uh, uh, occlusion, and uh, this has been described. So uh, one of the first things that they're doing uh, is uh, you know the uh, the heparin. Um, subcutaneously, so uh, it's not a, a matter of um, contra, like uh, um, use of other drug in combination. It's just a matter that you know the pathology itself can induce uh, you know an uh, um, hypercoagulation, and uh, so uh, this is a, is a, has been proved already and has been recommended. You, you were talk, talking earlier about being consulted for patients who, uh, possibly of having uh, endogenous uh, endophthalmitis in, in the cases uh, you are seeing. Uh, have you faced endophthalmitis related to, uh, this is a question from Dr. Al-Nusra, uh, patients really, uh, having endophthalmitis related to corona? No. I didn't find any endophthalmitis related, but uh, um, sometimes they can call you because they have like co-infection with or other for other reason. So like uh, um, other infection and uh, and the coronavirus. So they wanna uh, with the, for coronavirus just alone as infection. We didn't find any you know um, 
at fundus examination or in anterior chamber, anything related uh, with the uveitis. But uh, sometimes if there's something else in that patient, so they are asking, you know, to see, you know, the fundus and to see if there's no board or something else. I have a lot of questions from our pediatrics colleagues, uh, but I, I know that uh, the reports of, of pediatrics getting the infection is very low. Have you faced any cases in your institution? No, no one. In my, and uh, right now we have uh, three, uh, almost 300 patients, a uh, little bit less, uh, COVID positive, hospitalized, and uh, we, I didn't see any, um, any, you know, child. And um, so the situation seems that is uh, not uh, a big issue for them. And, and uh, back to the findings in the retina, have, so far have you found any, any p findings in the retina in any of the patients that you started on treatment? Or is it just a theoretical, uh, basically? So you mean related to the drug toxicity? Uh, drug toxicity. Yes. Okay. Drug toxicity, we have the suspect of a few patients, okay? Um, of course, uh, uh, I mean, we are just setting up this, because uh, at the moment, uh, I mean, we are in the middle of the infection, okay? So we have not really many patients that want to come, you know, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the clinic. Uh, and uh, so um, just because we had, uh, you know, few cases, just few cases, but really a couple, um, we start to think about that. And uh, so... Oh. Um, an another question about uh, topical steroid. I'm not sure what's the relation here, but uh, uh, have you uh, either uh, stopped using or, or uh, topical steroid on patients who have uh, active uh, infection of corona or or does, do you, is it uh, by any chance uh, something that but you... Topical steroids, we are not using topical steroids because, uh, you know, at the end, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the con viral conjunctivitis, we are not using, uh, you know, uh, steroids because even for, you know, adenovirus, you know, sometimes you can use it, but we know that the chance to get, uh, you know, back the adenovirus if you use, you know, the steroids is at the moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we are not using right now for, you know, a coronavirus, even because really the conjunctivitis is not the big issue. You know, the, the, they are really, uh, you know, fighting with uh, something uh, very bad. <laughs> so, and we are not using topical conjunctivitis. Okay, the question was actually placed, uh, maybe I misunderstood it, talking about patients who are on, uh, uh, let's say a PKP patient who is actually on topical steroid, whether you want or you think of, of stopping it as uh, uh, if, yeah. if they have COVID-19 infection? Yeah, we, so um, we are stopping uh, topical steroids and uh, the patient that, that uh, you know is uh, positive uh, um, can have uh, you know uh, systemic steroids okay uh, because it's one of the you know is in our protocol uh, you know as i was showing you before uh, but not topical we are uh, stop using a topical even if the patient was uh, you know taking it before because uh, we don't want to like increase uh, like the proliferation or any kind of uh, you know um, um, proliferation of the, the virus, so we stop using steroids topical. Okay, uh, yeah, we have an another question here from Dr. Abdurrahman Al Saadi. Uh, uh, he was asking about organizing the service. Uh, how do you deal with the staff? Uh, at your institute who might have uh, COVID-19. I think you've talked about this earlier, uh, but probably maybe you could uh, elaborate more. What kind of symptoms at which uh, you advise them to self-isolate or undergo testing, if you have any of your staff? That's yes, you, you are speaking about the staff, not yes. about our okay. So the staff, uh, as I was telling before, so two, two, you know, separate staff, one for positive, negative, and according to the age of the patient, uh, age of the ophthalmologist, of the uh, the comorbidities that can they can have, and also to the um, uh, to the uh, you know 
parents or uh, you know other people that are living with them okay so the, if they are you know in this category they are considered high risk so they are working mainly in activity that with the covid negative still as i was saying before for also for them we protect them you know as much as we can because you never know if one covid negative is really negative or is positive okay so but at least uh, you know we have uh, you know a, like uh, free covid area uh, where they are working on and um, so and uh, this is uh, uh, we are just splitting uh, you know based on you know these uh, find these uh, you know Okay, I, I see a question about um, uh, G6PD. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, I think it was part of uh, the presentation earlier. Do you, do you test uh, patients from this? This is a question from uh, Tarek al uh, Test for what? G6PD. Um, G6PD? Yeah, it's... Uh, G6PD, Karen, uh, Mario. Sorry? G6PD. Glucose, say phosphate, hydrogenase, pelugene, pelfavis. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, so, sorry. Um, uh, so, we, we are. Uh, I explained in Italian, so it's easier. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they are also testing for that. Yeah. And uh, um, of course, this is not uh, a, a you know, topic that uh, we are uh, managing you know, as ophthalmologists. So, uh, but uh, you know, they also you know doing it. A specific question about uh, about your patients who are cancelled now that you uh, that you're cancelling elective cases. Uh, talking about retina per se, are you let's say cancelling those patients who are receiving monthly um, uh, anti VEGF injections for AMD? I mean, like uh, active uh, um, CMVM, uh, or you are you? Uh, what, what are you, uh, what, how are you dealing with those cases who are considered critical uh, cases? Okay, um, if you uh, want... anti vegf overall as, as, uh, as, uh, as a management, so you, we have certain indications, definitely. Oh. You, you... Um, if you want, I can share, uh, you know, um, okay, L let me tell you before. Uh, so in uh, that paper that we published, you see exactly, you know, uh, all you know the the categories that are high risk, moderate, and low risk, and uh, the EVT, so the maculopathy, is, is at high risk. So um, we think that we need to carry on doing injection, intravitreal injection, because if you know the lockdown is for like two, three months, four months, as you know we are at the beginning of you know the third month, so um, we need to carry on doing injection uh, because we cannot stop doing it. So and uh, so intravitreal injection is uh, in uh, in the, um, that group, uh, and uh, we are doing we really. It really takes a lot of time because you know we we are doing injection like uh, in one day we can do at most like um, uh, 10 15 injection uh, here in Lombardy right now so uh, that means uh, you, as you know you know takes really a lot of time and uh, uh, so but uh, this is one of the things that uh, we are doing a uh, question about uh, what the, your practice uh, so far and uh, with, with patients who are asymptomatic uh, with conjunctivitis, do you offer them, this is a question from Dr. Hazazi, uh, do you offer symptomatic, asymptomatic COVID-19 patients with conjunctivitis um, hydroxychloroquine treatment as prophylactic? Right now we are not giving hydroxychloroquine as a prophylaxis and uh, um, so we are just starting when uh, we is sure that it's COVID positive. Uh, even if the patient is back home now, you know, is uh, the protocol is uh, uh, starting with uh, you know hydroxychloroquine and just in case it was you know going to those, but um, uh, not really hydroxychloroquine without be sure that it is positive as prophylaxis. And also uh, azithromycin we are using now back home in combination with uh, um, uh, with the hydroxychloroquine. 
so, so I have a couple of questions about uh, uh, just just a final question. I think we're almost over the time now. But uh, uh, the question was uh, someone uh, Nora Jaffer was mentioning that uh, Dr. Uh, Lee, who, who passed away unfortunately in uh, in Wuhan, was uh, 33 uh, years old. Uh, so can we still rely on age as a risk factor uh, in staff assignment? Do you think this is a valid? Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, in one of the, my slides, you saw the you know stratification related to the age, and uh, seems uh, that uh, of course is lower. You know, in the yeah, age uh, um, you know uh, under sixty, still. Uh, we don't know if uh, there is uh, like uh, a, something related uh, to the you know adaptive immunity of each patient okay so sometimes it's not related just to the virus itself at the beginning they were thinking that it was uh, like uh, a different uh, changes in the virus now you know the um, the uh, the community, the scientific community is going more for you know an uh, adaptive immunity different in each one, and so we cannot really say something. The numbers are still saying that you know if you are under sixty, the chance you know to get hospitalized is less, but it's not zero. But we don't know you know when we need to be you know uh, afraid of that and when you know. Uh, Adel, sorry, I'm here. Um, I wanted to ask, there are some few questions left. Maybe Mario, do you have still some 10 minutes to finish the question or you need to go so we can sure, finish sure, them? Sure, 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 sure. Okay, so I think I'll just finish the question that you have there and then we can, can, we can close. Okay, so, uh, um, so there was a question about, from Dr. Saad al Harbi about uh, early cessation of steroid that might cause um, early graft rejection. Uh, do you think um, even if there is no uh, very not very clear evidence of uh, of of, um, of, of uh, that topical steroid will affect the patient, would you risk the uh, the rejection uh, and stop the steroid? No, in that case, depends on the situ systemic situation. I mean, if it's under control, I will uh, actually I will uh, you know give uh, to both get the steroids but also the drops that we were speaking before okay like uh, with uh, um, uh, ozone or uh, um, iodine but uh, in that case i will not stop the the topic steroids okay thank you very much uh, we really appreciate your time i i think um, uh, we've uh, we've taken a lot of your time so far we time that you might want to spend with your family. I know you're, you and your wife are, are very busy in the hospital these days, and we hope you, uh, you stay safe, and, uh, and we hope all the best for you guys uh, there in Bergamo. No, uh, I think you... Dr. Abdelaziz uh, Rajha, our CEO, would want to add something. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Abdelaziz. Professor Mario, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm Abdelaziz Rajhi from King Khalid Special Hospital, and we truly appreciate uh, the time that you took out of your very busy schedule and your family time to be with us. Uh, we're uh, we're all uh, rooting for you guys, and we're all praying for you that that you go through this, hopefully with with the best results uh, possible. I have just uh, uh, one final. Uh, come uh, presentation and during the discussion I lost the, uh, the connection but in a hospital like in Khalid a specialist hospital where we only see ophthalmology cases we don't see general cases and we uh, COVID patients are never referred to us and if they have uh, symptoms they never come to us for treatment we have decreased our activity to do only the urgent cases and emergency cases we're not seeing any routine cases and we screen all patients from the entrance and anyone with symptoms or history or temperature does not get in. And we only allow the patient alone to come into the hospital unless he's very old and need assistance and we allow one, one person to be with him. With all of these precautions that we take, what are the precautions that you would advise our ophthalmologists, optometrists and professionals to take when they are examining these patients? These patients are not theoretically 
are not COVID patients, they're not even suspected patients, they're regular patients. But what precautions would you advise? So, uh, first of all, thank you very much, really, to share with me, you know, different things, because really, you know, in this period, uh, you know, you know, the best thing is just to share and to speak about many things, because, you know, you keep, you know, thinking about different things. So I think uh, you are in the best situation because uh, you're, you have just uh, the problem of uh, you know, asymptomatic patient that is coming in without you know, any kind of symptoms, with uh, the fever, without fever, so that can pass uh, through the you know, triage, entrance triage of the hospital, can go through. So basically, is, uh, I mean, there are very few. And so, the, I think the only, um, uh, of course, uh, trying to get, uh, you know, uh, the uh, mask, even the surgical mask on and this kind of stuff, of course, fine. But what uh, is, is the advice probably, you know, to um, leave uh, the high risk uh, patient, high risk, uh, you know, staff, uh, you know, to doing some, something different. So to don't stay with the patient because uh, if they get the virus, then become really in a bad situation. So um, and uh, so, if like uh, the the like the older one or the one that are doing uh, have high risk, uh, you know, because of the uh, they have like parents, uh, old parents at all, to you know do something different and uh, just for a while and. Uh, uh, this is the only precaution. Otherwise, you are already doing, uh, you know, everything, and you have no really, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, population that can be, have any impact on your activity. Perfect. Thank you again, and we truly appreciate the time that you could, took off to be uh, to be with us, and it's been a real pleasure to host you. And we look forward, hopefully, in the future to host you physically at. Uh, yeah, sure. This I'm very happy. You know, now we are, you know, here, you know, in the, between a few <laughs> meters, and really we want to go, you know, up there. <laughs> it will be a pleasure for me, you know, to, you know. It will be a pleasure. It will be a pleasure, and we're all praying for you guys in Italy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Mario. See, Mario, grazie mille. Thank you very much for being here. It was a very uh, nice overview and uh, very nice that you could take time to be here. I really appreciate it. I hope to see you in person soon. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Marco. Grazie. And uh, so, see you soon. <laughs> see you soon. Really see you soon. Thank you.